would take me uh, about uh, once or twice a week. I was there two months. Where were you? Uh, in the uh, Illinois State Psychiatric Institute. And at uh, 11 o'clock, they would interview me. And the doctor would sit on the side, and he would ask me questions. And I would sit in front of camera, and I would uh, turn my face towards him, and I would go ahead and answer him. And so every day, the doctor would ask me, a different model, uh, one of them old-fashioned axioms, like a stitch in time, phase nine, and he would tell me, uh, now what is the meaning of this uh, old-fashioned uh, word, and what is the meaning of that? And um, I couldn't remember all of the old things. And then he would say to me, uh, he would question me, you like all the employees, yes. And you like uh, the place, the place is beautiful, yes, I would answer. I, I, um, I think the building's wonderful. It had air conditioning, it had uh, a central heating, and uh, all the latest things, uh, the blinds and, and inside screens, and uh, beautiful beds and private rooms. And I said that I think it's very admirable for uh, experimental patients. Did you like doing that film? I, I, I did most of the time. And then the sixth time, he pulled one too many of these old things on me. He asked me, he said, what is the meaning of people living in grass houses should not throw stones. And then when he said that, I didn't like that saying very well. And then okay. I said, I said to him, now, now mind you, this is after, after having filmed six half hour shows for him. And I'd done it with great patience. And I'd done it with great precision. A answered him all the questions and how this medicine affected me and that medicine affected me. And then when he pulled off this sixth uh, model, this old axiom, it, uh, to me it's obsolete. People that live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. And so then I suddenly got the idea. And then I said to the doctor, I said, uh, he, he happened to have a real common name, Dr. Smith. And then I said to him, and now, Dr. Smith, I'll answer you that axiom the way I think the meaning comes out. I'll answer it to you perfectly if you'll tell me the meaning of an old, uh, old saying which people uh, years ago always used to say in front of me uh, that I heard since I was a young uh a, a young girl, and then he said, what is the old saying that you heard when you were a young girl? And then I said, well, I'll tell you the meaning of that if you'll tell me why did the old folk, the old grandfathers and the old grandmothers years ago, they used to say, doctors bury their mistakes. Uh, during World War II, the poultry stores went out of business. And these Irish uh, families, they, they couldn't find a source where they could find uh, purchasing duck eggs. So they would tell my husband a year ahead of time, they were so anxious and they loved them so much, they would scramble up a couple of duck eggs, was eating like three or four chicken eggs, two. And so they would tell my husband, and then I would order about 25 ducks, and I would raise them. See, the difference with duck e uh, ducks is you don't have so much disease worries as with chickens. You don't have so much uh, cleaning with ducks, and you just have to keep them dry enough and warm enough in the freezing weather and give them corn enough 
uh, to keep them healthy. They're much easier to raise than chickens. And I had beautiful white ducks, and they had uh, beautiful white eggs. But uh, ducks would always go and, and sort of wash themselves in the water, and they'd muddy up the eggs a little tiny bit with flex teeth. And duck eggs always had to be washed. And then I would try to pack them in regular chicken boxes. Uh, sometimes we had uh, these uh, these uh, little chicken uh, crate boxes, you know, and the duck eggs would just lap over, and I would pack them nice and neatly and firmly and pack them in uh, two dozen uh, packages. And we'd give... Uh, we give uh, as many repairmen as we could a turn to buy some, and just for the occasional treat. They didn't. Uh, the duck eggs good? Yeah, these Irish people love them. Did you eat them? Well, I would take one duck egg and scramble it up with two chicken eggs because the children were uh, objecting that duck eggs have a stronger taste than chicken eggs. See, chicken eggs has a, a, a two mile taste. You don't uh, you don't get much of a what you would say a eggy taste off of a chicken egg. See, and um, and uh, uh, for ourselves, we would always uh, scramble together the duck and the chicken eggs to lessen that strong taste. But Irish people adore that strong ducky uh, taste, the duck egg. Well, I tell you, I used to wear makeup on special holidays, uh, uh, on Sundays when I go to church or something like that, and uh, uh, visiting or shopping, and at home on the inside of the house, I uh, didn't wear them much around the household because it was uh, uh, what you would call a nuisance, you know. And then uh, whenever I went to store, I would always uh, um, wash up nice and dress up nice and put my makeup on. And I always went to the supermarkets and the churches and shows and sometimes weddings and different occasions with makeup on. Why don't you wear it now? But since I've been at the hospital, it, uh, and, there, and there is so much crowd, you know, and, uh, and I'm leery, uh, since uh, my husband passed away, I'm so leery of strange men because I witnessed a lot of times that there would be, uh, it wasn't uh, common, you know, but there would be um, like an exception to the rule w amongst them, uh, amorous fella. And I thought it's better uh, not to wear makeup regular uh, because uh, I would attract too much attention. And I used to wear makeup to go to town shopping. And uh, sometimes I would uh, wear to go to church uh, chapel on Sundays. Did you wear it for your husband? Oh, yes, when uh, we would dress up especially. But in the house, my husband would always say that he loved women that were their natural selves in the house. In the house. And he was the type uh, that he would always say, uh, just be yourself natural. And he'd say, uh, when we have occasions, you know, where we are amongst other people on the outside of the house, he'd say then's the, the best time uh, to put a little uh, dressy look on. And so at home, uh, we always went natural like that and wore our casual clothes and um, uh, always forgot about uh, being formal, you know. Did you love your husband? Oh, he, he was adorable, and he got along with me wonderful. And we, uh, we have occasional differences, and we always iron them out. 
and then the, uh, a normal marriage, you know, is always kiss and make up. And my husband, all, that was his motto. And sometimes he would bring me gifts if he had said a harsh word because he was working public service transportation, you know. And sometimes he would come home cross once in a while. And if he had said a few harsh words to me, he would bring me a little box of candy. And he, he, he was the type that he wasn't uh, uh, adept at saying, forgive me or this or that. And then he would present the candy with a hint. And he would say, you know this is because I had said those harsh words. He wouldn't say, he wouldn't say for, uh, he wanted forgiveness, but he would always show me in different ways. And then sometimes on holidays, he'd bring me a little quart of port wine, and, and he would show me, uh, well, this is because I want a special treat for you for putting up with me all year. And he was one of those appreciative kind of a fellows, you know. And then uh, occasionally, uh, like on my birthday, or uh, if it would be on a, on a uh, Christmas or, a, or a Easter or something like that, he would always pull out a 10 or $20 bill he had earned by, uh, by uh, sort of chaperoning the, the drunks on his, uh, uh, on his public transportation. They, uh, th there were some fellows that were regularly went to taverns. Sometimes in town you see them staggering, and sometimes these fellows would get on his streetcars. So then he would earn a little bit here and there. He would earn a 35 cent. He would stop his bus, and he would, uh, especially if the drunks lived near the corner, he would uh, chaperone them up towards the door, you know, point him towards home and uh, show him the door. Or uh, sometimes if the fellow was close enough to the bus, his home, he would even ring the doorbell and the wife would open the door and uh, pull the drunk in. <laughs> Well, see, when I was little, um, m my mother took me to the dentist, and she found out that my uh, teeth were all impacted, that I was born with a tendency to impacted teeth. And that is, they were, the roots were deeper in the gums than usual. And so the dentist said, uh, don't, uh, don't work too hard polishing your teeth, he said, you have the type of teeth that must come out earlier because you have uh, impacted teeth. When did you get your teeth out? Uh, when I was 41, uh, uh, I had to go to the dentist, and I had to get them out two at a time because the dentist worked so hard yanking. And uh, he would only do two at a time. And my husband never wanted me to go like some women go for operations where they uh, get put under anesthetic and they get all of their uh, leftover teeth uh, uh, in their 40s. They get them all taken out at a time and then they put uh, uh, plastic covers over. And my husband didn't, never wanted me uh, to go for operation like that. So I went two at a time. I had the uh, when I was 41, I had ten, uh, 17 teeth left over, and I had uh, crooked wisdom teeth. My mother said when I was born in 1916, they had had a milk strike, and it was very difficult for her to get milk at that time. And canned milk was very unsatisfactory, and they didn't have dried milk at that time, and they didn't have these uh, like they have in the drugstores now, those, those, uh, those soybean milk products, you know. They didn't have that when I was a little baby. So my mother had a difficult time uh, getting me milk for the first year. I nursed. I nursed, but she didn't have enough uh, nursing, and she had to supplement it with milk. And uh, at that time already, uh, there were strikes, you know. What about, why don't you wear your teeth now? 
And so I went, I went, uh, I think it was uh, um, when, when I was 42. I went without feet for a year because I didn't have the money. And then when I was 42, uh, my husband went and took me over to uh, medical clinic in, in McHenry. And uh, they fitted me up with teeth. And uh, when I first used the teeth, I was surprised. I noticed that the bottom gums, they told me that I had very bad bottom gums and that I had been born that way. And I said, yes, I knew. I said, the dentist that had put in my fillings when I was 14, he told me not to try to say my teeth to get uh, as close to middle age as I could to get false teeth because I would never have uh, good teeth on the kind of the impacted gums. I had a miniature rooster and it had been uh, in, uh, it had been in a chicken crate uh, wh uh, wh where they were sending newborn. And this chicken had been dropped at the uh, place where they hatched it out, and I didn't know it. And I had these uh, brooders, and I was brooding these uh, day-old baby chicks. And this one little chick, for four days, I didn't notice it eating, and I turned my back on it all the time, and I thought that I had dipped them all in water and uh, dipped them in feed. You have to dip each one of them, uh, give them a taste of water, and then give them a taste of feed when, they're, when they arrive from the hatchery. And, uh, and it turned out that this chicken had been dropped, and it was stunted, and uh, uh, surprised me that a newborn chick could live for four days without food and water, and it shrank up, and I noticed it was shrinking and shrinking, and then I took it out and separated it, and it, uh, it was, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the drop was connected with its head, and it was similar to cere cerebral palsy, and it turned out to be a miniature chicken without having been born, uh, uh, the, the real miniature chickens they call banties, uh -huh. and this was an artificial banty that had been accidentally produced by dropping. Oh, no. And I had that, I had that um, uh, dwarf chicken for 14 months. Did you eat it then, or what happened? No. Uh, uh, the children had uh, animals, they had some puppies, and the puppies went and attacked it as one day when it was 14 months, it, uh, it was always half the size of a normal chicken. You know, the normal three-pounders like you get in the store. And I had an interesting time with it. I studied it for 14 months, uh, enough so that uh, maybe someday I could write a story about the chicken, you know, a, a little uh, sort of like a children's story. And, and uh, I would go... And uh, when I separated it, I would dip its head for days. It seemed as though the brain injury, what the chicken uh, would normally feed on all the time and have the, the normal desire to, to bend over and drink water and drink feed. And then for days, I would dip it in the... Uh, and dip it in, uh, dip it in the water and dip it in the drink. And then I noticed that it uh, wasn't catching up with the other ones. And I used to give it special little treats of buttermilk I had uh, because I, ha I also kept some goats occasionally. I kept some goat milk because uh, occasionally my husband had small troubles with uh, small ulcers. And then I would have some sour goat milk, some buttermilk, and I would dip it into the buttermilk, and I would give it little tiny bits of lettuce like you do a canary or something like that, you know. And that bird flourished and grew nice, but it never was more than half the size. 
It was about a pound and a half or so. And uh, because I raised it separately in, in the box that it had arrived in, I used that for a playpen for the chicken alone. And then, of course, I had to pretend once in a while uh, mother's cries so that the chicken wouldn't get lonely. I would say, buck, buck, a little bit, and it would eat, you know, with those little signals, uh, the, the human nature, uh, I should say the animal nature would take over, and I would get the idea, and it gradually uh, formed the habit of eating regular without me bothering with it. It's something like in the zoos. Occasionally they have trouble with uh, uh, an, uh, a zoo animal uh, discarding its young, you know. And this little thing was something like a zoo animal that had been discarded. I'm really looking forward to my discharge uh, because I had other uh, troubles in the past discharges. Uh, the last four times I had uh, Sometimes economic trouble, sometimes I had diet trouble, and sometimes I had uh, medical reaction trouble on my last discharges. And so now this time I'm hoping to tackle all three of those things together and harmonize them from my past experiences. <laughs> Oh. 